and that should give you a pop-up. Mm -hmm. okay. Awesome. All right, welcome to Life's Not Linear, Adira. Um, thank you so much for being on today. And I'm very excited to hear uh, more of your story. So um, if you could start, or I'll let you take it away for your introduction and where you would like to start your journey. Sure, um, so definitely uh, thank you for having me and I'm glad to talk about how my life has not been linear. Uh, just to give you a little bit of background, I was born outside of the US and my parents uh, moved our family to New York when I was 10 years old. Um, that obviously was nothing that I was even aware of um, or you know the thought of that that could happen. Um, was far from my mind then. So, you know, definitely life has been a series of uh, transitions. I grew up in New York, decided to go to school in the Midwest. Um, so that was a culture shock in and of itself. And then decided to move back to New York to start my adult life. And, you know, that has provided interesting twists as well, um, in, including, you know, me choosing my career as a, as a strategist for the advertising industry. Um, that I am today uh, have I've been doing it for 15 years now so so yeah you know I'm glad to, to chat about it yeah I'm excited uh, where did your family move from uh, I was born in the Dominican Republic and then when you were um, at that age you said you were 10 did you like I guess how did you feel when you were transitioning during that time well, actually, my parents didn't tell us that we were moving. Um, you know, they thought that we were too young to understand the magnitude of what we were doing. We had visited uh, before. We had visited New York. I had traveled to Puerto Rico with my parents. So we had flown uh, before on vacation. So it was normal in that way. So it was not, not that part was not new to us. And we just thought that we were going to New York to see snow because it was the mm -hmm. winter time, which we had asked them, you know, we want to go see snow. Um, so that part of it um, was normal. What, when it suddenly hit me was after we were in New York for a week that I started asking, when are we going back home? I wanted to go back home. And that's when mom said, you know, we're not going back home, we're gonna stay here. And, you know, she, she shared that I would have friends from many different places and I would go to school here. And I couldn't even grasp what that meant because in my country, we were all Dominicans and you did see, you know, one person, a traveler from here or from there. But when you live there, you're not really that exposed to other people. So even trying to understand what having friends from different countries for me was a challenge because I didn't know what that meant. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, that's how my transition went. Um, it was definitely a culture shock to go to school in the U.S. to have to learn a completely different language. Uh, and my siblings and I were in private school in the Dominican Republic and we were the top students in the school. Mm -hmm. So to come and be unknown in this huge system uh, and to, to essentially have to create a name for yourself and to prove yourself because you're, the smarts that you knew you brought, nobody else could see or was aware of at that time. Um, so that took a while and that, that was hard, you know, as a child to deal with that, that was hard. That sounds so scary. Just even like you said, aside from the culture shock, but the shock of the new school system and whatnot, that's a lot to handle as a kid in New York too. It's very big. Absolutely. Now I can put words to it as an adult, mm -hmm. but I felt anxiety every single day I was going to school. I couldn't even stomach walking in and smelling the food from the cafeteria. Oh my God. You know, that was really harsh for me. And, you know, mom thought I was overreacting, but I just, I, the, the smell of the new space and foods that I was not used to eating nor liked um, mm. that, you know, and then having to go and, and live my day in English when I understood maybe 10 words, mm. you know. So, you know, I was in a bilingual class and I did make friends. Um, so that made the transition relatively easier because I had, I was around students that had experienced the same thing I was experiencing maybe six months before, you know, they knew a little bit more of the system and 
I want to say within six to eight months of being here, then it became, I became used to it. And also, you know, having a, a new teacher that following year who was amazing, you know, amazing at just seeing everyone for who they were and learning each kid, um, you know, and that's one relationship that I kept until she passed for the rest of my life. <laughs> that's awesome that you had somebody so impactful. Um, definitely st uh, teachers are underpaid and I feel like uh, you always you find like that one special teacher that kind of just like treats each student as if they were like their own kid and that makes like a world of difference so I'm glad I would you say had that. yes that my siblings and I have definitely been blessed in that aspect because I can tell you that I've had uh, numerous teachers throughout my learning my student career at different stages in my life that have definitely been so impactful um mm -hmm. and i feel fortunate because i know that not everyone has and then not everyone has as many as i've had the fortune to have mm -hmm. and so how was the rest of um schooling like going into high school and as you got older and going through that process so i'm a middle child i have an older sister and a younger brother and um, so Moving through schools was not difficult because then my sister had already done it and had met the teachers and we were familiar with the environments. Um, when I was going into high school, I was going into the high school that she had been in for a few years. So she helped, you know, navigate for me. She told me, you know, there's this honors program. She got me the application. She knew the teacher. So, you know, I was able to, to test into this honors program. Mm -hmm. and she got me involved in student government because she was involved in student government. So I was actually involved in student government for my whole high school career. And I was essentially following in her footsteps. She was student body president and, you know, I followed, you know, throughout. Um, so that, you know, to me was, was very helpful in just my whole high school career because I, I was exposed to a lot then. Um, and I took advantage of all the opportunities that, that presented themselves for me. So I was able to, as a student government person, travel to Albany a couple of times um, throughout my career to, to go and do the, you know, the, the state legislature of New York and learn it and, you know, act as an assemblywoman, you know, different things that I used to do. I was also able to travel and um, be student representative for New York. I, I, I was an exchange student to Israel. So I lived in Israel for a month when I was a junior uh, in high school. So that was another program that I got involved in because of student government, an exchange student program. So, you know, that, my, my high school career was a lot of fun. And, you know, focused, my parents were very focused on our education. That was the reason for the move. So we knew that and we, we put all of our energies into our education, we were involved in student government and, you know, a few clubs. I'm not the sporty type, so <laughs> not, I didn't do any sports, but, you know, anything else um, I, I did do. So that was how, you know, I chose high school. And then when it came time to choosing college, um, I was following my sister's footsteps again, even though there's a funny story. I said this would be the last school that I would ever go to because she went to school in Ohio, Miami, Ohio. And I applied to six different schools, and that was like my last choice. Mm -hmm. And I did get accepted to Columbia University, UPenn, where my sister had been. Um, I was waitlisted, uh, or no, not even waitlisted for Yale, which is where I really wanted to go, mm -hmm. uh, Connecticut. And I think there was another school in North Carolina that I was applying to, uh, one in Georgia, and then this one in Ohio. And one of my teachers did get upset with me because she's like, how are you not going to go to an Ivy League? And Ivy League accepted you. And I'm like, I'm not trying to stand, stay in New York because mm -hmm. that's why I went to Columbia. It was too close to my mom. And I'm like, she could show up and, you know, at any point. Like, that's not what I was looking for when I was 18. Mm -hmm. Now I would love for her to show up. <laughs> yeah, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, um, you know, I was trying to, to live out of the state because I wanted to be an adult and to feel like an adult. My sister had transferred from UPenn to Miami of Ohio for her psychology program. And what Miami of Ohio did was give me the best financial aid package. Mm -hmm. I could not turn it down because I knew that even though I was going to go into debt by going to Miami, I was going to go into less debt than had mm -hmm. I chosen 
the other schools. Uh, so to me, that was part of, you know, the decision as well. You know, how can I afford it? Um, because my parents being immigrant, they didn't have money saved for us to go to school. Mm-hmm. You know, we had to figure it out uh, on our own, especially me being the second one, right? Because they had, they were already, had given my sister a lot of money to go through her schooling. Um, so, you know, that's how I chose where I ended up. And I, I chose it too. You know, why I applied to those six schools was specifically because I wanted a business program. And I wanted one of the top. So Miami was on the top 50 business schools in the nation. So, you know, I got a good ride to it and I could get scholarships. So that's why I chose it. That's awesome. Um, Your sister must feel good. (laughs) She's setting a good example for you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, How was that transition from New York to the Midwest? Oh, my God. I went to visit her to see the campus. Mm -hmm. And... I was, I was, I'm walking around with her and people are saying hi. And I turn to her and I'm like, do you know these people? <laughs> and she's like, no, they're saying hi to you. And I'm like, to me, like, oh, yeah. people in New York don't say hi to strangers. We mm-hmm. don't, you know, you know, back then we certainly didn't. So I definitely say hi a lot to people in the Midwest. <laughs> right. And, and, you know, so to me, it was like so weird that mm-hmm. somebody would be addressing me when that was my first time there. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, that was a shock The two, I fell in love with the school and, and how beautiful it looks and just like how my mind had imagined college should be. So moving there, my, my high school had 5,000 students. So moving to Oxford, my high school was bigger than Oxford. You know, mm-hmm. it, the, the school became alive when all the students were there. Uh, but in the summers it was like, living in a town as big as my high school or something like that. Mm-hmm. So that was a shock. The shock too was being such a minority. Mm-hmm. In New York, my school was 65% Hispanic. So mm-hmm. I was, you know, in good company. It was everywhere you look, somebody looked like me or was from where I'm from. Mm-hmm. In Ohio, no one was from where I was from. And I had to explain to people many times even where to find it on a map. So that was different. And it was a difference that I welcomed because for the same token, I was not used to being around a lot of Caucasian people in New York, uh, where I grew up in the Bronx. So, you know, I thought that that was an exciting and new, new thing to explore. Like, this is what I had thought and imagined America would be like. And the Bronx America doesn't look like the rest of America. So let me go check out what the rest of America looks like. Mm-hmm. And, you know, and, and absolutely a lot of learning experiences and a lot of cultural exploration other than my own. And that, has, that experience has gifted me with so many friends from many different backgrounds. Like today I can say, just like my mom told me when we moved, that I would have friends from everywhere. I have friends from everywhere. And it is beautiful. It is a beautiful thing. Yeah, that's awesome. I feel like just being able to know people from so many different parts of the world just makes you feel more connected. And also, like you said, like the cultural experiences. Um, I'm really glad that you were able to like go into that with an open mind. Um, and so what did you study at um, Miami? And then how was that? transition like where did you go after you graduated so I have a degree in uh, business management and it was organizational behavior management I was interested in running businesses and learning just the business side of things Mm -hmm. I was always captivated by that at first I thought I was going to be an accountant but I'm too much of a people person for that Mm -hmm. so you know I quickly realized talking to you know different counselors like okay I like this side and I liked like HR I like the people side and Mm -hmm. that's how I ended up with organizational behavior it was the you know the psychology of people in organizations Uh, so you know I, I chose that and when I graduated, I'm like, I could do whatever. Like, I could really work in anything. I have a very broad major. And I was looking, uh, one of my marketing classes was, I had a lot of fun in. So I wanted to go to an advertising agency. And I did have like one interview in an advertising agency and mm-hmm. merged with another company. So they couldn't hire me at the time. Mm-hmm. And I was like in such a rush. I'm like, I just need a job. I graduated. Um, 
And I ended up taking a finance job at the World Trade Center. Um, and it was, I was going to be assisting a, a, an insurance broker. And I told them, I'm like, I, I, I just want to learn something, any business. I'm not picky at the moment because this is my first experience. So I just wanted to have, you know, the experience. And it was fun. I quickly realized that that's, that was finance was not going to be for me. Again, I'm like too creative, too much of a people's person. Mm-hmm. So I, I started looking into graduate school um, after that. In the meantime, the World Trade Center thing happened. And, you know, I worked at Tower 2. Um, so I helped the company rebuild uh, after that. And while I was doing that, I was applying to graduate school because I wanted to, I still wanted to be, you know, in advertising. And I knew that at that point. So I went ahead and applied to the VCU Brand Center, which is in uh, Richmond, Virginia. And I, you know, I resigned my position there and I said, you know, this is, this is how I'm going to get to what I need to get. And I, I did want to do that gap between school and graduate school. I wanted to be the student coming in with work experience. I didn't want to go straight through. So I had done that. And while applying for graduate school is where I learned what a strategist does. And I, if I tell you, like, I just fell in love with the explanation of it. I was like, this is it. <laughs> because uh, a strategist is responsible for, again, the consumer behavior and the consumer knowledge at the agency. So every campaign starts at the strategist's desk first. And I thought, me being a bilingual, bicultural woman growing up here in the United States, I have a lot of just innate knowledge for me being who I am that I can bring to the table of a lot of people that are now back then in the early 2000s wanting to speak to Hispanics. And I I know that. I know that world. I know my parents' world and I know my world. So, you know, that's why I chose to be a strategist. And from my application process, I said, this is what I want to do. I want to dedicate myself to the Hispanic market. And I went through my two years of schooling and, you know, sure enough, graduated. I had, a, I had an internship, and I remember my first week in the internship telling my, my mentor, I want to do the Hispanic market. Like, <laughs> I was not shy about what I had done it for. And that is exactly what I've dedicated my, the last 15 years to. You know, I've been a strategist and have provided Hispanic consumer knowledge to many national brands and small brands and local brands, like, you name it. I, I've done quite a bit. Yadira, you always just inspire me. Like you, you know what you want to do. You're not afraid to just like ask for it. You roll with the punches and you make it happen. And that's awesome that you just like knew. You're like, all right, I'm going to do this. And now you've been doing it for years. Like show I that it was a lot of strength. <laughs> the only time that I actually considered turning my back on it was when I became a mom. Mm-hmm. Uh, and when I have my first baby, I... I tried to do like the, you know, work and be a mom and all this kind of stuff. And it was heartbreaking for me. Like I I was successfully able to do it for maybe two months. And after that, my husband and I sat down and I'm like, I'm, I'm quitting. Cause there there was, to me, the exchange was too pricey, right? Mm -hmm. I didn't want to make my firstborns anything. Mm -hmm. So uh, I actually took a hiatus for maybe two, two and a half years. Mm -hmm. Because I remember um, after, after Josiah was born, I resigned. And then I did not go back until I, after I had had my second baby. Mm-hmm. Uh, he was a baby and I went back part time because I missed it at that point. I'm like, you know, <laughs> this mommy thing is great. Yeah. I'm not, I'm not a just mommy person. Mm-hmm. I was not cut off for that either. So that was a learning experience in and of itself, you know, learning who, who I am. Mm-hmm. and to, to be honest about that and not to dislike any part of who I am. I am a mom yes. and I'm also a professional woman that loves doing both. Mm-hmm. That's awesome. Um, there's so many things. I have so many questions. But <laughs> if you don't mind, if we could go back to when you worked at the World Trade Center, um, you knew that like finance wasn't really for you, but you said you stayed and helped the company like rebuild. And I would love to know, first off, like how you were able to get through that, um, through that 
catastrophic event, but also like what made you want to like, you know, keep going and drive to rebuild the company that maybe you weren't like super passionate about? Mm -hmm. So a, a number of things. The bigger picture is that it was all part of me healing. Mm -hmm. So when, when the towers come down, I lose friends and I lose coworkers and I am in limbo. And yes, I wonder like, should I even go back to this company? But what am I going to do if I don't, you know, like the whole status of my city, even in, you know, in terms of trying to find other work, why would I put me mentally there when mentally I did not want to be anywhere that engaged and the company that I was working with would understand and so would my coworkers where I was mentally because we had all lived through the same thing. Mm -hmm. So part of me helping rebuild was therapeutic. Um, I did get a lot of help. You know, we had uh, group therapy at work. I had individual therapy outside of that. Um, so, and, and part of that process is if I helped the company rebuild and put the literally p pieces back together, it would be like me putting my pieces back together. Uh, so, and you know, it is true when they tell you, don't make any rash decisions when you're grieving. I didn't want to make any rash decision while I was grieving. I wanted to allow myself the space and time to do that. I was supported by a group of friends, by my church. I was living with my parents. So I had a lot of love and support to help me heal. And I took, I took it all. I took it all in. Um, so that's why I stayed. And while keeping my eye on the prize, like, yes, I want to go to grad school. But because I happened in September, I had almost a year to be able to make that decision and to go through my application processes and stuff like that. That's a really good perspective. I didn't think of it that way. I'm being able to heal while also kind of healing the company as well and having that support system that like that understands and can like truly empathize with you. Thank you for sharing. And then, okay, so you said you went to grad school and then um, and then where did you work post-grad? You worked for an, a an advertising agency? Yeah, so when I was in grad school, my last year of grad school, I met my husband on a trip to New York. Mm -hmm. And I, I did not, I was not planning to go back to New York whatsoever. I had told my mom like, okay, after, after my grad school, I'm gonna move down to Miami because I can do what I wanna do. And then I meet my husband that last year and he was so, such a nice guy, like everything that I had prayed for. Mm -hmm. So I was six months from graduating and because I wanted to, to check out like, is this going to work with this guy? And he had just moved to New York. Mm -hmm. I decided to go and start my career in New York. I had a lot of options of agencies there. So that was going to be easier. And I had already established some contacts there too professionally so that's how I ended up back in New York and uh, one of and the agency that hired me back then it was Euro RSCG they needed a bilingual planner you know and in my class I was the only one that was bilingual and I said you see like this is the right thing that I needed to do like now they're looking for people like me yeah. <laughs> in my class of 20 something you know I was the only one so I did get hired shortly after I graduated. Mm -hmm. uh, I think I have been, I have moved back to New York for like a month when I had, when I got that job and I was very happy about it. And that's how I started my career in advertising. The year before, like in between my two years of graduate school, I did do an internship as well okay. in, in New York as well. So I spent the summer in New York and that's how I was able to like get some contacts, meet some friends in the industry. Mm -hmm. So that was fun too. That's awesome. And then, you could we talk a bit about the let kind of the balance or um with being a mom and also loving like your job and how you've been navigating that as well so when i went back when i went back to work um i i needed the flexibility because the second baby was so young i was actually not even looking for a job well, actually, let me backtrack a little bit. When my firstborn was one and we just had him, that's when I already started noticing, like, I've given this child this whole year and I've loved everything that I was able to teach him. You know, I was mm -hmm. able to, like, he read his first word at 10 months. And I, I'm convinced that that's because I was on him. Like, I was, it was mom here with him every day. Wow. 
So, you know, I was impressed by everything we were able to accomplish. But at the same time, I felt a little bit unfulfilled. Like part of what I wanted was not going to be fulfilled by everything I poured into my child. Mm -hmm. So at that point, I started my own brand to be able to consult and do things even for nonprofit organizations and neighborhoods and businesses in the neighborhoods Mm -hmm. that I knew didn't have the advantage of a strategist. So it was, how can I reinvent it within the space and time that I do have to give? So I started working with uh, churches, small businesses, nonprofit organizations, in building their branding and developing their logo and their websites and stuff like that. So I did have fun and I had, you know, that side gig while I was home um, being a mom. Then we decided to have another baby. And, you know, that was an easy decision because I was home and I had all the flexibility in the world. When, when Josh, my second baby, was three months, one of my friends calls and says, we're looking for somebody just like you. And I'm like, I'm not even looking for a job. I just had a baby. And she was like, we'll take whatever you can give. So you name your schedule, you name, what, what is it that you can give us? Um, and that's how I went back. I went back part-time. Mm-hmm. I named, you know, my hourly rate and I told them I, I can be here these days and from this hour to this hour. Mm-hmm. And by the way, make sure you have a nursing room because I'm going to need to be pumping milk. Yeah. <laughs> you know? and, and they accommodated. Um, so right. that's how I was able to go back. And since then, um, that was the schedule I had in New York until we moved, uh, let me see, um, nine years ago or eight years ago, we moved down to Florida. Mm-hmm. And that was the first time that I took another like full-time job wow. while being while being a mom. The boys were already ages where I could send them to school and I was comfortable doing that. Mm -hmm. So I, you know, found them a preschool. uh, And, you know, that's how I was able to, to, we were able to relocate. And, you know, my husband is from Florida. So it was nice to have him back in in his environment. And because, Mm -hmm. remember, my goal was always to live in Miami. Like, (laughs) the world for me. And, you know, the life that I wanted to give my boys. So, while moving and at every point since I am very honest and transparent about my needs as a woman and as a mom Mm -hmm. because that always comes first for me I cannot be my best for work if my boys are not taking care of my children at this point um so I I told them I needed flexibility on Fridays that I wanted to at least pick up my kids you know one day a week whereas Mm -hmm. the other four days my husband would do it Uh, But I want to be that present mom. So at every point in time, I've been able to to discuss it, negotiate for it. Um, So again, not being shy about what it is that I want and need. And if we need to meet in the middle, we can. Or, you know, it's it's a conversation. I always bring up the conversation. Even now, I have been working for the agency that I work with now uh, for a year. And at that point, like, I was feeling that, again, I'm not completely happy. So what else would make me happy? Uh, what is my next? And that's when I decided to, to resign my position. And through conversation, we again ended up with a part-time schedule for me uh, that would work out great for both the agency and myself. So that is you know, how I've been working for the past year now. That's amazing. The fact that throughout you telling me everything, these different checkpoints of like, you know that you're not fully happy. So what's next? What can we figure out? And that just inspires me to like reflect more and to not hesitate to ask or have the conversation. And I think that's, that's awesome. I don't know where you learned how to do that, but that's awesome. Because we have to realize that at the end of the day, it's our responsibility. Our happiness is only our own responsibility. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I cannot look at anybody else and blame them for me not being happy. Mm-hmm. So that's why I always check in with myself. And sometimes I give myself deadlines. Like, okay, mm-hmm. you can check in with yourself a year from now to see where you are and how you feel. Mm-hmm. Uh, because if I am feeling off or something is not working, then again, it's my responsibility to fix and figure out how to get to what would make me happy. That's awesome. Thank you, Yadira, for sharing with us today. Um, Usually, I ask if there's anything else that you'd like to share, and also if um, you'd like to give like one piece of advice to the audience. Sure. So, 
you know, my advice would be just, you know, what we talked about, take responsibility for your own joy and your own happiness. Uh, even though we have a lot of relationships in this world, we may be parents, we may have parents, we may have siblings, we may have a spouse, a significant other. Uh, it is no one else's responsibility to keep you happy, nor will anybody know you as well as you know yourself. Mm -hmm. So, you know, keep searching, keep pushing, um, and figure those things out for yourself and spend the quiet time to do it. You know, uh, a lot of us would define success by what we see other people do or what we think other people expect from us. Mm -hmm. But sit with that question yourself. How would I feel successful? How would I feel like I have reached my highest level of potential? And then go seek that. That's what you want. You're awesome. Thank you so much, Yadira, for sharing today and for just um, chatting with me again. It was so nice to see you. My pleasure, of course. Thank you. All right, I'm just going to stop the recording.